Welcome everyone to the 30-minute Midas Touch from beautiful Dyersburg, Tennessee at the Herb Welsh Wrestleplex. Now, here is pound for pound and inch for inch, the best of the best in professional wrestling today. A wrestling genius worth his weight in gold. The Golden Boy, Greg Anthony. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 30-minute Midas Touch. I am your host, the Golden Boy. Greg Anthony, and with me is my co-host, the Sinister Minister, Oh, Mark Tipton. The Sinister Minister. Oh my goodness, now not only you, you're you uh, uh, branching out there, but now I, evidently I've turned heel now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do appreciate the introduction and the uh, new moniker for the week, and uh for those of you listening, it does uh, reference the subject matter of today. And so this uh, this edition of the 30-Minute Midas Touch podcast, we're going to uh, kind of uh, complete things a little bit. Uh, in a previous episode, we, we discussed the role of politics in professional wrestling. And at that time, I said, uh, I quoted that there were two things that one does not discuss in polite company. Well, luckily, we're not in necessarily polite company in this instance here on the podcast because we're going to discuss the other subject that one does not discuss in polite company, and that is religion in professional wrestling. Yeah, and this one is going to be, um, I think it's going to be interesting, to say the least. Um, You know, my thought process on religion and professional wrestling has changed over the course of my life, um, very much so over the last, you know, four years. Um, so for me, it's going, it's going to be an interesting to to kind of relive some of the, some of the things we're going to talk about and my thought process then versus my thought process now. All right. And, and when we say this, we want to, we don't want to be too, I don't want to be too dismissive or like I'm not taking this seriously because I know this is a serious subject for a lot of people in their lives, and I don't want to uh, be disrespectful in that way. But uh, professional wrestling always has referenced, you know, all aspects of human life, and religion is a major aspect of our society. And so it seems, you know, silly not to think that religion is going to enter into it much as religion in various forms enters all walks of our life it affects everything and so uh, i understand why professional wrestling references it um i guess the first thing is because it is such a serious subject to so many people uh for very valid reasons we understand do you think it is something that professional wrestling handles well and general uh, not really you know, there seems to be a very, and like I said, this 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 is my position now as an almost forty year old husband, father, you know, someone who who who's recently, you know, over the past couple of years, really found his faith and and Jesus Christ and all that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> for me, it's it's changed so much. But wrestling historically has been very sacrilegious in a lot of instances about things that are going on. Um, I wish that it was painted more in a a positive light because professional wrestling itself to me is, is like I've said before, is the most beautiful form of storytelling out there. It's better than movies. It's better than music. It's better than television. It's better than literature. To me, it's better than everything because to me, professional wrestling is boiled down to its simplest form and in its simplest form, it is good versus evil. It is God versus the devil because you can't believe in God without believing in the devil. You can't believe in the devil without believing in God. So for me, I just wish that um, professional wrestling, like I said, viewed religion more in a positive light. You know, obviously, um, organized religion has been, you know, something that's that's been a, um, I would say, a crux in this the entire time because politics obviously dictate in, in organized religion, things like that. But when you get down to brass tacks and, and actually the word of God and in faith and things like that, I think it becomes a lot more um, palatable. All right. As you uh, describe the way professional wrestling has generally handled the subject, uh, the first thing I, that came to mind is I just, well, the, the phrase that came to mind was cheap heat. 
Uh, because religion is something that is, you know, that is seen throughout cultures across the world, even if you don't want to talk about just here in the United States, uh, religion and various religions, and so it's something that everyone understands and they kind of know the dynamics of. And so when a wrestler uh, comes to the ring and does something that is, let's say, at least somewhat sacrilegious or kind of mocking or imitating, he knows that is something that's going to get a strong reaction from a large percentage of the audience just because a large percentage of you know, society uh, holds it so dearly. Do you think it kind of became a cheap form of heat, so to speak? Yeah, I, I think that's a fair assumption. I mean, um, like we tell we tell our young guys all the time, it's it's really easy to get heat when you know you tell uh, the girl in the front row, "Hey, fat bitch, sit down." You know, what I mean, that's cheap. You know, obviously someone's going to get pissed when you call them a bitch. You know, what I mean, that's that's not really working. That's not really getting you know actual heat that's like you said cheap heat so like for this this is a you know a hot button issue you know what i mean and i'm not <clears throat> i'm in no way am i considered um you know a, a snowflake <laughs> in the sen- <laughs> in the sense that like i can't take a joke or i can't take things for what they are um some things do bother me now like i i'm not a fan of the monday night messiah just because it just feels wrong to me you know what I mean? I don't, I don't like the Monday Night Messiah. I don't like – this is – once again, this is me now, you know, but now I, I don't like the King of Kings because the King of Kings was oh, I, Jesus Christ. So, I mean, and, and, and to me, using that to, to sell T-shirts and things like that, I just – it feels wrong to me as a Christian. Okay. Um, well – what you, what you really hit me with that King of Kings one, because that's one that I had in, in preparing for this as I thought about things. I had not thought of that one, but I do remember at the time that that one actually bothered me. Um, in fairness, I'm coming at this almost a little bit different than you because I was raised very religiously, but I will admit as I've gotten older, it's it's a little less a part of my life than it was. So I'm, I'm in a different place than you are on this. Mm-hmm. But even I, when Triple H came out and did that, and he used that terminology, um, kings and things like that, has been a part of professional yeah. wrestling forever. No one thinks twice about it. But when you make a direct reference like that, uh, and that's a comparison that you're drawing when you refer to yourself with that name, because that's generally been referred to one individual. Yeah. Uh, and at the time, I, I thought that was going too far. Uh, so I, I do understand those that would be insulted by that because it did appear on t-shirts and i did have to listen to jim ross introduce him as that yeah and um and and that's kind of not to get too on the religion side of this but that's that's what the devil wants the devil wants people that that don't believe this or don't think it's a big idea so you know it becomes it becomes palatable to them to to do these kind of things and oh it doesn't matter you know that kind of thing when it when it actually does you know what I mean um, so that's that's the whole devil's purpose is to to take God out of people's lives in general so if you can desensitize them to hey you know we use these these names and these phrases as punchlines or to sell gimmicks or whatever it may be then you know then then becomes less value in your life all right. Uh- <clears throat> Yeah, thank you for indulging me on that because when you mentioned it, I I regret I had not thought of that on my own because I remember at the time being upset about it. Now, generally, I take a pretty uh, kind of open-minded. I don't know. I I don't. I generally will let most of that stuff go because I understand that they're you know they're trying to get a reaction from the audience, and I get well. That's what bothered me about the King of Kings because it really wasn't. It was just kind of the name he used. He didn't really use it. But I need to not get caught up on that. You mentioned the Monday Night Messiah. Uh, now, I will say, and uh, kind of come at you this way, that's one that has not, at least as of yet, bothered me to the degree that the King of Kings did. Yeah. Um, and I want to see if you think, because when I see it, it's he's almost, he used the term Messiah, but, and he did have a disciple, so I suppose, uh, because they did refer to the, you know, um, Murphy is that, but to me, there wasn't as much of a direct 
religious. And it, it to me, when he says it, it's almost like he's a, a leadership kind of thing. Yeah, but <laughs> but uh, but um, like I said, the Money Not Messiah, and obviously there's been there was a Messiah. In, in hardcore wrestling in the early right. 2000s, you know. I mean, the word Messiah has been used before. Um, <clears throat> but for this, I mean, not only does he call himself the Monday Night Messiah, and, and there is a fine line we're walking here. I completely understand that. Um, when he calls himself the Monday, Monday Night Messiah, then all of a sudden he's got a stained glass artwork. Oh, sure. The Be- the imagery is unavoidable. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, to me, yeah, you're 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 ripping off – you know, religion to do that. And to me, like you said, cheap, you know, Seth Rollins as talented as he is, you know what I mean? Why does he have to go that route to get a reaction? Why can't he still be the Kingslayer? You know, why can't he still be the, what he wasn't the ultimate opportunist, what, the architect of the shield. Why can't he be the architect still? I understand we have to reinvent ourselves um, every so often, but <clears throat> for me, to, like I said, to me, that was just, a step in the wrong direction, especially for someone like him. All right. I had I had been thinking about in sort just kind of the verbiage he used. He's always talking about uh, have everyone accept his leadership role kind of a thing. But the imagery you do reference to, it is unavoidably religious imagery, as I think about his entrance in particular is what, what came to mind. Uh, and I could say, well, do you feel that when they use that imagery, do you think that, oh, well, let's be – right at it does that disrespect those who will take that so seriously those who that that stained glass imagery you were referring referring to priests or preachers you know pastors what have you do you think uh him putting himself in that role was insulting to people for whom that is their life's work Uh, quite possibly you know obviously like i'm coming at this from like i've my faith is only a few years old you know if, if if this had been something where you know, I'd been to seminary like some of my friends have and, you know, dedicated their life to the work of Christ and things like that. And you see someone, you know, just using it on television just to just to elicit a reaction. It probably would bother me just like I, I would be bothered. I am bothered by people that try to use professional wrestling in that sense after I've given dedicated my life to it. Um, it's just, you know, we religion and wrestling like. To me, there's not enough guys in professional wrestling that are really advocating for Christianity. You know what I mean? When you, I mean, I, I'm one of the few guys that actually openly talks about God and, and religion and being blessed and all that kind of stuff. Like, it's it's very few and far between the guys that talk about that kind of stuff. I mean, literally, we can sit here and talk about okay, Shawn Michaels obviously is a huge thing. Ted DiBiase, uh, Tully Blanchard, you know, um, there, there's there's some obvious guys. Yeah, I was trying to remember now, Tully, did he actually uh, kind of go into a ministry of sorts? As he, I was, he was a minister, and he actually went to prisons there, okay, and, thank you. And, and, and ministered to, to people who were uh, convicts and tried to get them back on the on the right path. So, and like, and then there's like Jake Roberts, like we've talked about before, like, he was religious, but was he really religious, or was he just using it for whatever particular reason? You know, so it becomes one of those things too. Like, um, and we have to wrestling's always going to mirror society. Um, so that was the case with like Brother Love. You know, Brother Love. Um, you know, he to me this wasn't mocking religion, but it was mocking the people that mock religion. You understand, though, that Jimmy Swagger, you know, uh, evangelist 80s thing, that was a big thing then. You know what I mean? The, the Sunday morning television where they, oh, touch the screen, I want you to do this. And, you know, that was a huge thing for us growing up, right? So for him to uh, to parody that pretty much with the Brother Love character, that's the kind of religion stuff that works. You understand? Like, that's the kind of stuff that's not – sacrilege but hey we're going hey this is a part of organized religion or a part of religion in general that we don't like and can be can be used to open maybe open people's eyes about because brother love was not a a good character <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> no he, he, he was of, of he was not of moral standing so like he, he lied and cheated and even though he was talking about love and forgiveness and all this other stuff because i love you and that's why he does all of these things that he does he does it 
out of love. Exactly. Uh, I do uh, like you brought up two or three names that I had down that I wanted to discuss in various aspects. But since we talked about Brother Love, um, I do try to remind myself that some of the members of the audience of this show may not remember the time in which Brother Love came along. They may have seen uh, the character portrayed and, and referenced it, maybe gone back and watched it, but you may not have understood. That was a time in history where there were a number of popular uh, televangelists on the television, uh, the Jimmy Swaggerts, the uh, Jim Bakers. Jim Baker, yeah, that's I, what I was going on. Yeah, all those. And all those people, um, in in the eyes of many, were kind of using religion uh, to enrich themselves. They became very wealthy yeah. and uh, didn't always live up to what they were preaching. Today, Joel Osteen. Oh, that, well, there's... <laughs> That's that's a good you know the the super church idea. Yeah, well the and then Joel Olstein for instance, just to not get too too much off tangent here, but um, when Houston had all that huge flooding, yes. you know, and they needed people, they needed places to go. Joel Olstein wouldn't open the church, so people could could camp there. Mm. You know what I mean? That that's a huge. Mm. thing right you know like here you're, you're supposed to be the word of god you're supposed to be about helping people mm. you don't mind taking seven figures from them but no no we're not we're not going to let them we're not going to ha- have our church be a uh, a site for this you know Ooh, i was not aware of that one yeah yeah that was um, that happened a couple of years ago and that i mean i didn't like joel scene to begin with well, but i mean <laughs> let, let me let me stay on the subject matter more because um a number of these televangelists had personal issues that arose and became very public that demonstrated they didn't live the things they were preaching. And so it became, and it made sense to me, or or at least I understood, let me say it that way, that uh, this would be something that would enter into professional wrestling and kind of mocking those people who, you know, they were in the news. And you often see things in the news work their way in some form or another into professional wrestling. Uh, and so that didn't surprise me. But I will say, I thought it was tremendous. And in fairness, I still, I mean, I've been, or before we started, I was swaying back and forth because when I thought about Brother Love, he was one of the names I thought of, I could hear the music in the background. Oh, uh, that's the slow, yeah, yeah. and the, with the choir. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, and the. And you could hear it, and the uh, and the choir kind of humming behind him, and it and it would go throughout his entire segment often, yeah. uh, and so and just the layout and the way he dressed, and uh, it was just really, uh, I mean, it was entertaining. But then whatever dastardly thing he was going to do, he always did out of love, just kind of to bring up the duplicitous nature of it. Uh, and we should give credit because the Brother Love character introduced a number of things. Yeah. And because for those of you who may not remember that it was Brother Love who introduced the world of professional wrestling to The Undertaker. Yep, absolutely. He was the first one at that Survivor Series that walked out with him. So uh, before they had uh, paired him with Percy Pringle slash Paul Bear, you know. Um, so, yeah, Brother Love was a huge part of professional wrestling history and, and one of the – you know, we talk about <clears throat> uh, exceptions to the rule. You know, if if not using religion and wrestling is the rule, then he would be the exception to it because that worked on all levels. All right. Well, on that, uh, I did want to slip in this reference because you did mention uh, Paul Bear did come along. It was actually Paul Bear was introduced by Brother Love, as I recall, uh, to serve as the manager of the Undertaker. Now the Undertaker was someone who had religious imagery kind of make its way in, into his performances from time to time. Um, and I will say, well, I suppose the one that stuck out of my mind that I want to see what you thought about was when they, in effect, placed, well, they placed Stone Cold Steve Austin on an Undertaker symbol and then, and then lifted him above the stage. Yeah. And, a, and there was a very obvious comparison yeah, it over, was a crucifixion. It was you know? it was in effect a crucifixion. You know, um, and I won't let you speak on that if you'd like to. Yeah, and that's one of those things. Like, hey, when when it happened, man, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. You know, but as I've gotten older, and I, obviously as my 
my faith has changed. It's one of those things I, I don't really, I'm not very fond of anymore. You know what I mean? Just because I understand its implications. And I think uh, even Austin himself had said, hey, he was bothered by that, you know, because he's a religious guy too, apparently. And um, the fact that um, they did that, and there was other crucifixions too, like legitimate, I mean, they actually did one in ECW as well where they crucified the Sandman, Raven crucified the Sandman. And um, that one was so bad that uh, Raven actually had to go out in the arena later and apologize to the crowd for doing it because it would, it would almost cause a riot. You know what I mean? And it was just one of those things where, and I think Kurt, that was actually one of the first appearances by Kurt Angle, like at a wrestling event. And like, uh, he had to go tell Heyman, don't ever show me on anything ECW if that's involved with it. You know what I mean? So, I mean, it, it's that kind of stuff that really, you know, some people get really upset about. And I, I, I understand now, like I said, I'm not easily, you know, swayed, you know, to, to be like that, but like, it, it does bother me now. All right. Well, it's, it's unavoidable because that that imagery, uh, I mean, it sticks in my mind to this day. I remember Austin as they because they were hoisting above. He was on the Undertaker symbol and was being uh, lifted above the stage because I believe they did it on the on the stage and seeing him being lifted high and then and then have him with the Undertaker, you know, in effect, pose and blow him. And the Undertaker, someone I'm trying to remember, was it he big evil? He was referred to, and I want to say the Red Devil for a while. Um, uh, yeah, he, big evil for sure. I remember big evil, but he had like a devil face on the side of his. Yeah, uh, he, he he did mix those sorts of things, and Paul Bearer mixed in a lot of religious imagery, although certainly nothing that I found terribly offensive. I don't think. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. Like Undertaker was a very dark character, and while and like, like I said over the years, like. I, I don't like all the supernatural kind of stuff that's went along with the Undertaker over the years. I think that the the character itself would have been just as popular and served just as well if it wasn't he wasn't you know shooting lightning bolts and catching things on fire and blah 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 whatever. Um, so, but a lot of that stuff was was part of that too. Like he has some supernatural ability to the underworld or to the to the dark side or whatever it may be, <laughs> Star Wars or <laughs> whatever we're talking about now. <laughs> yes. But I mean. Um, so for me, it's just I'm just not as big a fan as I was of that stuff when it was happening. Because, like I said, my views over the years have changed. All right. Um, well, coming off that, I'd like to kind of use that as a transition. We go from from that uh, situation. One subject that I would be remiss if I did not bring up uh, in the term of discussing the role of re- religion in professional wrestling is the individual uh, who was being in a in in effect, or in effigy, crucified in that was Stone Cold Steve Austin. And the unavoidable phrase that everyone listening to this podcast, I'm sure, knows is Austin 316. Now, I recall quite a many, you know, quite a number of people were upset about the use, because you're obviously drawing in a comparison to John 316. And I guess, as I mentioned earlier, I want a layout for the background folks. Um, this the Austin three sixteen came about after a match with Jake Roberts. We mentioned earlier he had Jake Roberts had seen the light or found religion in some fashion and, and would mention it in his performances. And uh, Steve Austin, in an attempt to, you know, play on that, uttered you know uttered the phrase. You come out here thumping your Bible and saying your prayers, it didn't get you anywhere. You talk about your Psalms, you talk about your John 3.16. Well, Austin 3.16 says, I just whipped your ass. And and it's lived on in infamy ever since. And even though this is radio, guys, I want you to know that he wasn't reading that off. He, he memorized it, as we all pretty much know, because it's that famous of a promo. And... um like I said, this is, I don't really call this one necessarily sacrilegious. I can understand how some people would be bothered by this. Obviously, Jeff Jarrett made a huge thing about it, you know, when he came in. But for me, um, because it was in the context of the story with Jake Roberts, Jake Roberts had had got the ball rolling, talking about Christianity and stuff like that, and and, and basically this was just Austin's rebuttal. You know what I mean? So I I know that sounds kind of weird, but like sometimes that's what it takes. Like. It's it's doing it not just to do it and not just to get a reaction out of it, but doing it to where it's telling a specific story. And that story was Stone Cold, Stone Cold Steve Austin is the man. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he's going to whip your ass no matter what you believe in. 
you know. So um, for me, like I said, that, it, that doesn't bother me as much as, as so many other things bother. All right. Well, I will say at the time, I understood because he directly used the, you know, mentioned John 3.16 before he said it, I kind of gave people a pass, although I will admit it didn't bother me. And let me say, I'm someone who grew up as a tremendous football fan. And for me, seeing John 3.16 on a poster being held by a guy in a rainbow wig in the end zone of a football game was not uncommon. So seeing references to that particular scripture and I, I know what it says and, and how important it is to so many people. Uh, but that kind of became John three sixteen kind of became a part of pop culture, so to speak. Right. And so using that as a part of the, his promo, uh, was okay with me and, and people obviously took to it. I know it was intended to be kind of a, my, uh, you know, an insult to Jake, but it became, the biggest it, thing ever. The, the right? biggest thing ever because Austin 316 was everywhere. It's still everywhere. It's people, still. People still buy, buy Austin 316 shirts. And, every, of course, every shirt he has, I think, has 316 in the skull or, you know, somewhere Somewhere. Yeah. That, yeah. And it, and it because it's just so trademarked as a part of that character of Stone Cold Steve Austin. Um, then some people will try to. Rob Van Dam 420. 20, yeah. which was a direct result of Austin 316. Exactly. And... And so I understood all that, and I will admit I did not take offense to it, but I do understand those who did. Um, and I, and perhaps, in my opinion, it might have been different if the what he associated as Austin three sixteen says. Maybe if he had closely mimicked the scripture itself, yeah. Uh, maybe then I would have seen it more. But you know, Austin three sixteen says, "I just whipped your ass." That's no, you know, if he had somehow mocked, you know, Austin so rules the WWE that. Whatever. Right. Uh, I might could have seen that differently. Uh, and I do, one of the other names you mentioned, I do want to get into. This was something, uh, because you mentioned Shawn Michaels. Mm-hmm. Uh, Shawn Michaels is someone who, as we know, had a big change in his uh, presentation of his character. Uh, prior to being injured and leaving for a time period, I guess it was about four years uh, after WrestleMania 14, when he returned, he was a far different person uh, in his presentation to the public. And he very clearly incorporated uh, crucifixes into his ring gear, uh, made reference to during his time away he had found religion, however you want to say it, and uh, incorporated it. This led to a match. Uh, and I looked it up this at Backlash 2006, just after WrestleMania. And it was what was posed as a tag team match Mm -hmm. in which Vincent Kennedy McMahon and, and his son, um, I think he referred to as the product of his semen, I believe is, (laughs) I need to look that up and make sure that's what he said or fruit of my loins or whatever. But he, he really laid it on thick in the build up to this. And they were taking on Shawn Michaels and his tag team partner was going to be almighty God. Yeah, this this one was so. It, what? Not only is it sacrilegious, not only is it you know um, bad for you know Christianity and things like that. It's just it's just bad for wrestling too. You know because it's so it's so uh, inflammatory in what's going on. I mean they had I believe if you correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, didn't they introduce God and they like had a spotlight yes you know come down the like oh here comes god oh yes there were harps playing and a spotlight indicated where god was as he made his way to ringside yeah see the thing is too like and wrestling needs to take a note from the movie industry in this sense like the movie industry actually has standards yeah there's some movies where the bad guy wins at the end and but those are very few and far between in the most part in the good versus evil in the good versus evil of uh, movies, um, good eventually prevails. But unfortunately, like in, in wrestling, um, sometimes it doesn't because we like we have a situation here where evil prevails. Now what? Now let me tell you this: like in this match, it, it was basically just a handicap match, obviously. But let me ask you this: How great would it have been if, in the middle of that match, Shawn Michaels is getting his ass kicked? 
and the lights go out, and they come back on, and Shane and Vince are laid out. <laughs> that that would have been entertaining. And, and, and then and then eventually Sean gets up, and Vince gets up, and he super kicks Vince. Boom, one, two, three. Like, you know, th- that's what I'm saying. For all the mockery that you do of Jesus and God and things like that, there needs to be a repentance. <laughs> You know what I mean? There needs to be some kind of form of justice after that, right? Even if it wasn't that necessarily that that God himself came and strike down Vincent's. But what if the lights went out and it was Triple H that had helped him? You know what I mean? It's something because God works in mysterious ways. You know what I mean? <laughs> Triple H would be a mysterious way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, it, it lends to, you know, an old story that I was, you know, that I've heard for years. It was... um you know, there was, there was a flood coming. The guy heard there was a flood coming on the radio. And, you know, um, they said, you need to evacuate your house. Well, he didn't want to leave his house, right? So eventually, you know, a man came by in a boat and was like, hey, you know, it's flooding. You need to get in the boat. We'll get in. He said, no, no, God loves me. God saves me. He'll, he'll save me, you know? So then a helicopter comes, and the helicopter's like, oh, get in the helicopter. And he's like, oh, God loves me. God will save me. Well, the guy ended up drowning. And he gets to the pearly gates of heaven, and God, he said, what are you doing here? He goes, "He goes, I thought you loved me. I thought you'd save me. He said, I do love you. I sent you a radio ad. <laughs> I sent you a guy in a boat, and I sent you a helicopter. What are you doing here? You know what I mean? And that's what people don't understand. People, I think a lot of people think that God is just going to reach down with his own hand and do these kind of things, but he works through so many other, other different ways. So that would have been a good life lesson <laughs> that could have happened in the world of professional wrestling. All right, and and for those of you who did not see this, I think Vince McMahon always tends to go over the top. And <clears throat> in the build-up to this, at one point he actually took a knee and uh, in semi-prayer said, uh, God, you don't like me and I don't like you as a part of one of the build-up to the match and those sort of things. And, and uh, I believe they went to a church at one point and I did like that it, even during these promos, Shane was looking incredulous at what his father was doing. Yeah, like he'd finally gone over all the things that Vince had done, but this was too far. You know what I mean? And it really legitimately was. You know, so, um, yeah, un- unfortunately, though, those are the kind of things we're talking about. Um, and that was probably the most, to me, I mean, I can't think of anything more sacrilegious than that, than that whole scenario right i don't i don't know what else in wrestling would be considered (laughs) yeah for all the things vince mcmahon does he he does not uh soft sell anything when he does anything he goes over the top in every way imaginable and he has done that throughout his time and this example which in the opinion of many and i went too far okay we are over time. Not too bad this time. All right. So, uh, once again, for myself, the Golden Boy Greg Anthony, and for my co host, the Sinister Minister, I like that. Mark Tipton, thank you and goodbye.